everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Bulletproof Hygiene. I hope everyone is having a very uh, fulfilling and productive week taking care of their patients. And I am so excited to introduce you to our guest today. She is an absolute rock star of a human. And if I'm honest, I'm kind of fangirling a little bit because I have had the privilege of attending multiple lectures by Dr. Susan Maples through the years, um, primarily at AOSH and IBM as well. And I am truly blown away by her passion for true health and wellness, her dedication to creating systems and education for the profession to treat our patients with the highest level of care, and really helping empower patients to own their conditions and take control of their health. And Dr. Maples leads a successful insurance-dependent total health dental practice in Holt, Michigan. She has a master's degree in business and marketing, and she has practiced in over 35 years um, in private practice. In 2012, she was named one of the top 25 women in dentistry and one of the top eight innovators, otherwise known as disruptors in dentistry, and you'll see why today. She's the immediate past president of AOSH, the American Academy of Oral and Systemic Health. You guys have heard me mention it multiple times. Um, she is the author of the book, Blabbermouth, 77 Secrets Only Your Mouth Can Tell You to Live a Healthier, Happier, Sexier Life, and also Brave Parent, Raising Healthy, Happy Kids Against All Odds in Today's World, both of which are incredible. I own them, I have read them, and I highly recommend them. They are very easy to read, and they're great for, to recommend to your patients, too. She is the developer of the Hands-On Learning Lab Kit, which is an interactional, interactional science-based learning program for dental patients, and also selfscreen.net, an educational screening tool for patients and clinicians to uncover signs of illness, such as prediabetes, diabetes, obstructive sleep airway disorders, acid reflux, and chronic systemic inflammation. She was co-investigator in an award-winning diabetes research study entitled, entitled Diabetes Detection in the Dental Office, and she's also the creator of Total Health Academy, which is a robust online learning curriculum for dental teams to develop a complete oral systemic dental practice. So without further ado, Dr. Maples, welcome to the show. I am so grateful for your willingness to share with our listeners. I honestly believe that your superpower is definitely seeing a need and finding a way to make it happen and then helping empower others to make it happen. So we are so glad to have you with us today. Goodness, Carissa, what a beautiful introduction. I kind of want to carry you with me on the road. The only correction I would make from that whole thing, and boy, you have done your homework. The only thing, correction I would make is that I'm an insurance independent. Oh, I'm sorry. I said that wrong. No, yep. no. Don't be sorry. I'm glad you did because it's an important distinction because so many people are trying to figure out how to become pertinent to the patient population uh, such that people will literally part with their own discretionary dollars instead of de depending on insurance companies to pay for everything inside of dentistry. And uh, we declared our independence on Independence Day 2000. How appropriate. Was a long time ago, right? Yeah. And it was a big celebration for my team. It wasn't a financial decision. It was to be able to remove third-party payers from the decision-making between the patient and the clinician. Um, so that oh, they could literally that. choose and not be cut off at the knees for what they chose. Yes. And so it's a blessing for us to do that. So I just wanted to make that distinction. Yes. But awesome. Thank you. Thank, yeah. Thank awesome. you for clarifying that for me. Um, I really wanted to have you on with us today because over the last several weeks uh, on the podcast, we've kind of covered some big, important topics when it comes to root cause and really connecting the dots for oral health and total health. And I feel like you are so gifted at having really constructive conversations with patients to help them acknowledge their own conditions and then take ownership so that they really are ready and able to move forward. And as hygienists, we get really overwhelmed with having enough time to take just the necessary assessments and then really deep dive into the medical history, discuss the patient goals, and then try and fit all those pieces of the puzzle together to help a patient understand the systemic ramifications coming from their oral condition or vice versa, like how what we're seeing in their mouths is signaling, signaling more serious issues like leaky gut or airway issues or diabetes. And you are a master at helping patients realize their potential for true health and laying out the steps to, for them to get there. So will you today share some thoughts or tools that we can use to come alongside our patients and coach them to health? 
that is a huge honor. If my deceased parents, both of whom are deceased, could hear you right now, they'd be so proud of me because literally I was born with the ability to speak more than I could listen. And I have worked very hard on being able to develop my listening skills. And Carissa, you mentioned conversations. The idea that we would have a dialogue, dialogue literally comes from the word die, which is to back and forth conversation, not education, which is a one-way communication, which is the way we learn it in dental school or hygiene school. That if we educate our patients, they'll fix it. And honestly, if that were true, they'd all be flossing. So clearly it doesn't work, right? So the one continuing education weekend, three-day weekend we do every year with my team is called facilitating health change behavior, facilitation skills. And we bring in, and I'll mention it here because you may want to hire her, Terry Goss and Janice Duparte, and we've worked with them for decades and they come in every year and lead a retreat for us. And we literally work because you can never master the human race, right? Or a dialogue, especially with a difficult conversation. And for the listening audience, Chris and I both shared a, a patient we each had today, one that you had and one that I had, and we were talking about our frustrations and uh, you know, our communication and how awesome it is to work with people who want to be well, but how challenging it is also. So it is never easy. It isn't always easy for me either. Um, for me, it, it comes more easily than maybe some of you, because I've been practicing for years and the more we practice at anything, the better we get. So let me give you a couple of tools that you could start with tomorrow. Simple things. One, most of us, before we see the patient, we say these words, any changes in your medical history, right? To which they reply, yeah. no, because they think we don't care. And in truth, most of us in our profession don't. We're asking for medical legal permission to move past that, to scrape teeth. And so with that, Sometimes there, you know, these medical histories that are locked in the computer. Sometimes we don't even pull them up or we don't ask a specific question. And the medical history might be five years old, depending on how your office does that, right? It's so much better to have a verbal health history because you can make notes on that. And the health history, no matter what health history you offer, and I think mine is amazing because I've created an interactional health history so that I can tell which screening tools go with that, how we, how we can sort of, if you were to like click a box that you were interested in, and boom, you had some choices. It's sort of like that. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail about that, but I love my health history, but it still doesn't get into what's the priority for the patient. So Carissa, if I were going to ask you right now, and if you don't want to share, that's okay. But if I were going to say, what is the most significant thing on your radar for your health right now, or what are you currently working on or what health challenges? You notice none of these are yes or no questions, right? Right. right. They're all like, tell me something interesting about your health right now, your general overall health, something you're curious about, something you've been working on, something that has your attention. Now I've literally carved out a space to talk about something important to them. It's not about what's important to me right? because I assume if they show up, they're well enough to have their teeth scraped. And by the way, we know that is not what we're after, right? Correct. Right. So if I were to ask you that, what might you say next in all honesty? What's on your I would radar say right? I'm paying, I would say I'm paying a lot of attention right now to getting proper nutrition. Okay. And what does that mean to you? That means I'm focusing more on uh, intake of whole foods and trying to stay, stay away from processed foods, um, making sure that I'm getting good nutrients through those. Um, you know, I, I pay attention. I do a lot of olive oil. I do a lot of um, supplements. I do a lot of spinach. Um, just really staying on top of getting all the greens in. I think you've made a lot of progress and in- in a short time, I mean, I just saw you a few months ago and that I'm making, right. yeah, yeah. um, tell me what are some of the downfalls or what are the, some of the things that get in your way or the trigger foods that kind of call you back? 
So it's really just timing is the hardest part because, you know, I'm busy and I have, you know, I work full time and I do a podcast on the side and I mentor a girls group at church and I've got a family. So that's my biggest hurdle is just time. So I find that if I meal prep ahead of time, that's really easy. But the downfall is if I haven't meal prepped and I'm in a hurry, sometimes it's easy to just grab something that that's pre-made and that's not as good for me. So now for me, Susan, I would say, let's talk for a minute. Let me give you a few tips of what to do when you haven't meal prepped. I'd like you to have a few things in your freezer um, and a few things in your <clears throat> cooler that keep like root vegetables and things that keep for a long time, right? Um, and you have an air fryer and how do we, you know, I'd like to help you figure out how to have a really healthy meal when you haven't meal prepped, um, to sort of figure out those downfalls, but you see that I'm staying, what I call what Mary Osborne, um, originally coined staying in the question. Mm -hmm. I don't move on to, Oh, thanks for sharing. And your next question is, you know, it's, that's the way health histories are, right? right. Check box. I'm not check boxing. I am asking open-ended questions, getting more curious. And the beautiful part for me as the clinician, as the hygienist or the dentist is that I get to learn from you. Well, and, and I think there's some magic in that too with the patient because everyone wants to feel invested in, everyone wants to be interesting. So if someone is asking you questions and you're getting them to talk about themselves and what they're interested in, they've connected with you in a way that they otherwise wouldn't have. Absolutely. And it's interesting because the answers are going to be different for every person. Right. Sometimes it's a very sad conversation. Sometimes you're championing the person, um, but also... There are people who go like, I don't know, I just don't care, or they've lost their edge, or you can tell the sparkle in their eye is gone. And that's usually a sign of depression because all of us want to be healthier, even you and me. Right. Um, and we all seem to have those of us who are health conscious and health ready, have a conscious answer. But sometimes people, um, when they have depression for any period of time, they lose their mojo. They stop caring for themselves. You can tell that they've stopped caring for their teeth. Yes. These sort of anxiety, depression bouts create a dysfunction in their life. That's how we call it. That's how we know it's a dysfunction. Sometimes people need help. Yesterday, I had a significant, a patient who had, I could tell right away, I had a, an observer with me, a hygienist mm -hmm. um, outside of the practice. And, um, when um, my hygienist who broke her foot wanted help with radiographs. I said, I have a second, I'll take them. We took some bite wings. He hadn't been in for a while, a lot of calculus. And my the hygienist observing when I walked out said, wow, a lot of perio there. I said, I actually think he slipped back into a heroin habit. He's living, he's 50 years old, living with his parents, his parents. And I said, he will be very open with me. And uh, I'm not sure that perio will be on his radar right now. Right. So I stepped back into the room for the hygiene handoff. That's an interesting thing to talk about the hygiene handoff, yep. the communication from the hygienist to the dentist, because I'm literally stepping into a sacred conversation that yes. I have not been invited to yet. Yes. And you earn my place into that, even though I have a long relationship with this guy. So after Nikki kind of gave me the handoff, I actually touched base with him right away and said, how are you doing? And he said, not great. And I said, yeah, I could kind of feel that when I walked in before. And I said, I, I want to be here for you. Um, you know, what's showing up? And he said, just having a really rough time. And anyway, Nikki gave a little bit of the handoff. We had a three-way conversation. I asked permission for this hygienist to observe from the doorway. Yeah. And he shared with me that he had um, not been sleeping at all. They changed his medications. He couldn't sleep. And he said, the lack of sleep has literally caused me to relapse. And I've been using for five days. And I said, and you showed up for your dental appointment. He said, well, I knew I could tell you and I can't tell Aww. my parents because I will disappoint them. And I said, he said, I feel terrible. And I said, are you thinking about suicide? And I've never asked him this question. And he said, oh yes. And I said, how often, how many times a day? And he said, today's a bad day. And I said, then today's the day you need help. So anyway, we took char. I said to him, I want you to go home and be by your phone. And I want you to promise not to hurt yourself. Now, these are conversations that are very brave conversations. Yes. I'm not yes. expecting the average hygienist to be able to do this. I'm asking you to get started on the process of learning how to have a significant conversation 
that might be life changing. And indeed, this was. I could tell you the upshot, but I won't. But the point is that um, he chose to come here. And I said to him, um, Why here? Why now? And he said, Because I know you care about me and I know I could tell you and you would help me figure out what to do. Oh, that's beautiful. Let's not deal with the addiction right now. Let's deal with today, which is trying to keep you alive today. And he said, my parents would be much better off without me. They're, they're going to, they're getting older. I will be screwed without them. And he said, and I, and I feel so disrespectful right now. And he's very clear about that. So anyway, these are tough conversations, yeah. right? We don't yes. start here. Yes. We start with something interesting. Yeah. Yeah. What and then if they tell you something privileged as a hygienist, you need to ask when you're doing the hygiene handoff to the doctor, do I have permission to share what you yes. shared with me? Yes. And I know doctors who are listening might be offended by that. Like of course, they're my patient, my license, but the fact is it's a private privilege conversation and you can acknowledge in front of them you know, that they've given me permission to share some sensitive information. Uh, they're considering, ha- they're going to, they're, they're going to be having bypass, uh, you know, surgery to lose weight and they're, you know, feeling really sensitive, whatever it is. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I think the idea is we ask permission to share. Yeah. I love that. And I think, you know, we always have to get out of our own ways, um, our own way, especially, you know, the, I feel like there should not be a divide between dentists and hygienists. We are made to work together in a very beautiful way. Um, There is, if we're being honest, there's a very strong connection that hygienists get to form with their patients because the reality is we spend a lot more. In most practices, we spend the majority of time with those patients. So, you know, I think that handoff is, and we do that in our practice as well, but I think that's such a, a good idea um, and, and we do it to help our, our doctors too, because our doctors are busy and their ops doing, you know, restorative procedures and they're walking to, into a room unsure, like, who is this, what's going on? Yeah. So we use that verbal handoff as well to just kind of orient them to kind of connect everybody. We're all, we kind of sit in a triangle so everybody can see, we, you know, put the patient at the top of that triangle to really make it about them and just make it a, a relationship conversation instead of For just sure. a talking over them. One yeah. of the things that I think we can all do better in the world is not just to focus on more kindness, but less judgment. Oh yeah. And when we think about judgment, we often think of, when I say the word judgment, we think of judgy, like negative, but it, it comes in positive form too. If I tell you, oh my goodness, good job. Now, if I said to him, you're doing a great job and you know, every time, then would he be able to come and tell me when things aren't going so well? Right. So sometimes if you are all about like, I'm so proud of you. This is not what we say to children, by the way, we've learned to say to children, you know, sometimes you can say, I'm proud of you, but a lot of times you want to say, if they show you a picture that they painted and it's gorgeous and you're looking at it thinking, oh my gosh, this is my kid. I'm so proud of you. But you can say, you seem really excited about this. I'm so happy for you. That's a different message. Tell me what you love about it. Yes. Yes. How you did it. Tell me how it made you feel. What was the impact? Now you don't use that word with kids, but what about it? So we're curious about why they are coming to you, showing you this, right? Yes. Yes. And so with patients losing our positive judgment, but also the negative, and this is something that hygienists traditionally, not you and not my hygienists, but traditionally have been good at is criticizing when they're not doing that right. You know, and I want to say every time we point a finger, I've got three pointing back at me. I could say to Chris, well, when is the last time you had commercial food? Last time you were talking about giving up ultra processed food. How's it going now? And you tell me, and I'm like, oh my goodness, we'll get back on. This is not helpful. Correct. I always say, I told my son Hunter's 20, Nine now, but I said to him, I'm, I'm working on becoming 1% less judgmental every day because literally the best of me sees the best in others. And sometimes I'm not at my best. So sometimes, right. right? And he said, well, mom, you're already non-judgmental. Like that's going to be impossible. I said, no, honey, you know, 0.1, one times 0.1 is 0.01 and 0.01 times 0.01 is 0.01. We're never completely there. Right. And here's what I want to say. 
I've become really good at biting my tongue on judgment, but it's the inside judgment that I make that hurts me inside. And so if someone were to come to me right now and make a blatantly racial comment, let's say, and I'm offended by that, instead of saying inside, what an asshole, what I can say instead is, I wonder what messages that person must have received to have that level of bitterness in their heart. And I'm going to heap compassion on them. Right. And I'm not going to agree with them. I'm going to say, wow, it sounds like you're angry. I'm going to acknowledge what I heard without saying, without agreeing. Right. And, um, and in a way, bring compassion forward. Now, these are, again, learned behaviors. But when it comes to health, we're often judgy. Yes. And when they come to you and you're in a clinic coat with a good hair day and you have beautiful teeth because dentists and hygienists do, right? you are in a perfect position for them to feel insecure about who they right. are already. Right. Well, and, and I- they're, so they're showing you their mouth. Right. And, and, you know, it, this is a very intimate part of, you know, you're looking into this very intimate space. So I think, pile. It's yes, everything. yes. And I think, you know, I've been practicing long enough. This is 27 years for me that I have learned. We don't know anything. You don't know anything about where this patient has come from, what they've been through. And I've seen enough patients who have done masterfully on their home care but they still have issues with inflammation and bleeding. And, you know, to lecture them more about brushing and flossing isn't the problem. You know, these are patients that might have a leaky gut issue. They have airway issues, you know? So it, you, you have to take everything, you know, off the table because every single patient is so different and so individualized that if we're judgy, we're going to miss all those, those different aspects. Yeah, And we don't earn the right to influence. I had a patient today in who is um, overweight, blind. She's been blind since she was a little girl and diabetic, type 2 diabetes. And she's trying to demedicate to get some saliva back to cure that. And she also suffers from depression. She's got a curious problem. So she's got all this going on. And I said to her, do you feel well cared for by your medical team? Is there anyone there who you feel like? And she said, not really. She said, they don't understand that I know my body better than they do. And that is true for each one of yes. us. Yes. It's really true. And we often, you know, especially a blind patient, they assume she can't read and she can't do her searches, which is not true. But the fact is that we make assumptions that we know more than they do, and they need us to tell them about their body. And you don't know about their body, especially today with the internet. And you don't even know what sources they're using. You could learn a lot about pathology and disease in general from your patients. Right. Who, you know, don't be afraid to not know. You come to me and say, well, I'm really concerned about cardiomyopathy because, you know, I've been diagnosed with that as a child. And now, you know, like, tell me more about that. That's something I don't know a lot about. Tell me what your worries are, what are you afraid of? You know, how is it going for you? Do you feel well cared for? Do you feel like you're with the right cardiac, cardiac team? Like these are questions that we can ask in support of a patient and come out as a very caring advocate for them without ever knowing the details of what they suffer right. from. Right, yeah, I love that. How do you, because I know as hygienists, we come up against this a whole lot. How do you navigate patients that aren't open to the basic necessities that we need to really kind of assess the patient? You know, those patients that come in, oh, I don't want to do x-rays or, oh, I don't, you know, those kind of things that, how do you navigate those conversations? Well, I always make sure that the patient knows it's their choice. And that I'm there to help them understand um, all the ramifications of the conditions or disabilities and uh, get out of the way for them to choose. So that's their choice. And as long as they're knowledgeable, I don't take responsibility for their choices. 
which I know you might call supervised neglect. We don't keep people in the practice that won't address the blah, 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 or won't allow me to take this. Patients who are adamant about this are never going to come back to you and say, you didn't tell me I needed x-ray. You know what I mean? It's right. like, right. these are my eyes. I can see so much more if I could take some images. I understand. First of all, you want to understand what their fears are right. and what's the basis for that. Where's yeah. that coming from? Be very respectful um, and really, really try to, you know, let them know before you say one word that this is their choice and you never want to impose your thoughts and opinions on them. On the other hand, you want to tell them some of what you know um, so that they can make the best choice for them. So that's that. Now, a lot of people will ask me about salivary diagnostics because they offer that a la carte. In other words, well, I, I would probably do better with this periodontal situation if I could have you spit in a cup and look at the bacteria. Is, are you willing to pay $125 or whatever it takes, whatever you charge for that? You know what I'm talking about? Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. Your, your listeners know, right? Yes. You literally, we don't, we don't uh, believe the AAP, American Academy of Periodontology, that this periodontal disease is just episodic and you can't really ever master it. We believe right. you at AASH that you can, Correct. but you can't do it by scraping teeth. Right. You have to look at the bugs because scraping teeth and not looking at the pathology is like having both hands tied behind your back and fighting a gorilla. You can't win. <laughs> like you can't win. Right. So if, so if they're a perio patient in our office, um, even if they have were referred to us by the cardiologist with a high inflammatory panel and they don't look like a periodontal patient, we're doing a salivary diagnostic. And then when we find the pathogens that are creating the inflammation, even if they haven't experienced a lot of bone loss yet or any, uh, we call it subclinical work. Now, there may be not a lot of calculus there. Right. We're not looking for just white tight gums. Right. We're looking for a microbial shift. Yes. So in that situation, I just simply tell people in order to treat you appropriately to try to take this disease and make it a thing of the past. We're going to need to get some testing done to figure out what we're fighting here and figure out whether we need specific antibiotics to go with the specific bugs that might be creating this problem. And so along with that, if those are present, we'll be able to do a before and after measurement. We'll know we're finished when we've been able to shift this. The mouth is a home to about 900 different species of bacteria. And we're going to be able to um, find, you know, some of them are really healthy and some of them are just okay. And some of them are really dangerous. Right. And we're going to be able to target the, the most dangerous bugs that we know today, the ones that literally cause heart attack and influence um, 87 other conditions in your body and try to eradicate those or at least push them down to a level that is not dangerous or threatening to your body. And in order to do that, of course, we have to measure. So that to us is not like a, you have to, you know, do you want this or not? Hygienists feel like they spend too much time trying to talk people into an A1C test for diabetes or, and to me, we've taken all of that out of the equation. We bundled it all together. So the perio case is, um, estimated. In other words, we give a price tag on the case. I do mm -hmm. based on how many systemic risk factors that the host has, the patient has, and how many oral risk factors they demonstrate. And to me, I have to look at, including of course their home care and all of that. I have right. to look at what is it going to take if I give you Carissa carte blanche on the amount of time you spend. All I want to say is you want to treat this person like they're your spouse or your parent or someone you love. And I want you to get them all the way through to stability. And I want you to take as much time as you need to do it. And I'm not talking about teeth scraping time because right. that is an issue. I'm talking about 
helping them look at their diet, their sleep, their hydration, their stress level, um, stop partying like a rock star for a minute, treat your body like you have a disease. I'm talking about micronutrients. I'm talking about uh, making sure that that A1C is under control, working with physicians across the aisle to, to accomplish some of these, maybe a sleep study, like all of these things that you need, we're going to provide for one yeah. fee. That's incredible because that, that's, I, that's to me, that is the biggest hindrance. And, and I'm glad you said that because that was a question I wanted to ask you is, I mean, I feel like our current culture is very much like immediate grat gratification, easy button, like big farmers throwing pills at everybody, like just take that pill and you'll be good. And patients are coming in with that mentality of, well, no, I just want my teeth cleaned. And, you know, we're looking at you know, this inflammation and this massive infection, we know there's all these pathogens behind it. And there's so many other connections that are, you know, like you said, there's 87 diseases that this can lead to. So we're looking at this big picture going, how do we communicate all of this? Because there is no easy button here. This is really, some, sometimes this is a really big ask of like, this is, like you said, it's a whole lifestyle shift to really achieve health. And that's a daunting, overwhelming conversation. And, and to be honest, I feel like most hygienists don't have the time to have it or don't know where to even start. And so unfortunately they don't. So I want to give you something that I love to do in terms of now we're really talking about education when it's my turn to talk. And by the way, I have to earn my right to influence them. So I do a lot more listening before I get a chance to talk. But I'll often take a picture of a bleeding site or a red puppy papilla yep. or a red line around it. Now, by the way, if it's not gingival bordered inflammation, you could be looking at reflux at, at diabetes, at chronic systemic inflammation from food sensitivities, at fungal infections. There's a lot of reasons why people get red tissue. Right. It's not right. always because they're, they have periodontal pathogens or because they're not brushing and flossing, especially since dry mouth and all the acid reflux, 60% of our patients have reflux. But I, if it's a traditional like bleeding and probing and there's a red border and you can always find a red triangle between teeth, right? I'll take an enteral picture and I say, I want you to know that all disease happens on a cellular basis. So I'm going to zoom in on the cells in this area to see how the infection, the little bacteria bugs have have like snuck into the gum tissue. And the reason it's red is because all of your capillaries are opening up to bring in helper cells to fight the bugs. Just as if you cut your finger and within three minutes it gets red and puffy. The difference here is the red puffy heat sore spot will go away in seven to 10 days. This doesn't go away. This is called acute inflammation. This is called chronic inflammation. And I'm sure you've heard of that. Then I'll say, so what I want to do is I want to zoom in so you can actually see what's going on right inside of there. And I'll say, I pull out my phone like this, I put it on Google and I say out loud, white blood cell in pursuit of bacteria. And I push search. And then I go into the top where it says videos up there, right? Mm -hmm. And I pull up a video, the first one up and I show this and it's literally, um, white blood cell in pursuit of bacteria. So it's showing them microscopically what's happening. Can you see this? Yes, and I said, yes. this is a macrophage chasing after that little bacteria bug and the tissue, the, the gray part all around those other blobs is, is what's called, it's called edema. It's what's making it swollen. And the little blobs are the red blood cells. It's what makes it red. That is going to literally engulf and take care of that bacteria. And as it digests it, it kind of poops out the excrement. These are all inflammatory markers, sending signals to the rest of the body that we need either more or fewer of these macrophages to come to the site. Our bodies are amazing, but also some of those bugs sneak away from that site and go to other organs. Some of them are very, very aggressive and pernicious and weave their way into other cells and multiply and you know bring the little white blood cell with it. They call them foam cells after they mature. I mean, these can be very dangerous. So that took me to tell you about that. I don't know, 
a minute or a minute right. and a half and keep right. showing a video. But patients can get some of the seriousness of what we're talking about. Because let, her, let me ask you, Carissa, when you first heard that gum disease caused heart disease, you probably rolled your eyes and thought, oh, come on, what? Right. It was weird to us. Right. How yes. does that happen? Now that we kind of know the pathogenesis, you and I, right. how do we communicate that to patients in a way that makes it real? From a bleeding point, which we can say bleeding gums aren't healthy gums. Oh, they bled all my life. To like, actually, here's what's going on right yeah. on the inside. Yep. yep. So that's one of the ways that I use to communicate when I get to educate a patient rather than facilitate, which is that two-way dialogue, when I earn the right to have a little mini speech. And of course they have to be curious about it first, right? right? Correct, yes. Mm -hmm. How do you, because we know this well, um, that it is so much more than just a home care issue. You know, if there's airway issues, if there's gut dysbiosis, if there's insulin resistance, all of this is going to drive right inflammation in the mouth and patients don't know. I mean, I will say that I've loved that I've had some patients, you know, in recent past say, Hey, I saw something about heart health and mouth health. So I, I, you know, I love that patients are hearing more about it, but they don't know so much about the airway process and the gut dysbiosis. So how are you bridging those conversations when you're looking at somebody and you know, this is an airway issue, you can see all of that. So interestingly, we, um, our, our office is a whole lot for all of that, right? And mm -hmm. we actually have a two and a half hour new patient exam, not including hygiene. I know that seems decadent. My health relationship coordinator does a lot of facilitating, but I love it so much that I carve out my Wednesdays for new patients. And um, those are often big cases. Again, people wonder, how do you give away that much time in a new patient exam? And I want to say you're earning the right to do some significant dentistry. Right. If you're hoping people will trust you and spend thousands of dollars to do their dentistry after meeting you one time, you know, that doesn't really work unless you invest. Correct. So what we do is we have an interactive health history where we have questions in boxes that are clearly outlined, might say bone health or brain health or airway health. And if they have even one of those six or seven questions in there, yes, we'll go on to have a larger screening tool. So it's a systems approach to, so we're not giving them 10 pages of health history because that it's not interesting to them. Right. But if there's right. an area that's of interest to them, then they fill out a screening tool. Then it's like, wow, I have seven out of the 12 of these risk factors. Now they're all yours. So that's one of the ways we do it. And then have a conversation and really try to look for if we could make if we could help you make this different, what would be the impact on your life for you to be able to sleep well and wake up rested and not be depressed or anxious or, you know, all of that, what would be the impact if we could get you in the same bed with your spouse or you're not snoring at night, what would be the impact if, um, we could, you know, get your diabetes controlled at this point with diet and not have to have you be medication, uh, dependent or have the risk of blindness or kidney loss or loss of a limb, you know, all of that, like the impact questions are big. Yes. So yes. That, those are, that's a, just a smattering. Yeah. Of what we're doing. Oh yeah. We're doing. All of this is put together in total health Academy, which is a online learning Academy that I created. So people can learn how to do that. Cause it's not easy to just hear it here and do right. it. So, right. So yeah. That's it. Yeah. Um, so we're talking obviously about at this point, patients that are already presenting with issues. And I know that obviously we have to be reactive because that's what's coming in our door, but I know sure. you have a big passion and I think all of us hopefully do. I know I I've said this statement before that when I got into hygiene, it was because I thought it was going to be preventative and I quickly realized it's not as preventative. It's really not preventative at this point but I know you are very passionate about it becoming preventative and it starts with the kids. So I wanted you to speak to that because I know you wrote Brave Parent, which is an amazing book. Um, it really covers kind of all gamuts of how to really raise healthy children and, and avoid these you know, down, the, down the pipe issues that, that we can run into. So talk to me about 
I am so blessed that you asked. I had my fingers crossed that you'd asked me something <laughs> about kids. Um, Brave Parent is literally called Raising Healthy, Happy Kids Against All Odds in Today's World. And what I see is the slow, slippery slope of what Americans do, right? I want to live like this and have one bad day. And what I notice, because I've been in the same spot, I bought that practice in 1985, just 25 years old. And I've been in the same place and now I'm 63. So count them, this July 15th, will be 38 years. Wow. And what I see is that every sick adult was a sick child in the pipeline, but sick children don't manifest the same level of symptoms that sick adults do. All of a sudden they're caving in, right? Um, as adults, as they age and they have been suffering from these things. And so I have constantly had my eye on what would it take to get to the beginning? There's an urban legend told of a couple of guys fly fishing and they're having a great time until this drowning child floats down and they drop everything to save this drowning child in the river. And they're up on the riverbank and see another drowning child. And they, re they, they go in to get this other one and there's three more. And one of the guys gets out of the water with all these drowning children. And he takes his waders off and he puts his running shoes on and he starts hightailing it up, upstream. And he says, where are you going, leaving me with these kids? What are you doing? He said, I'm going upstream to figure out what is going on up there. And working with children is the upstream potential to avoid chronic disease for a lifetime so that they can literally live a long, healthy life. It's not about how long. It's really about not our lifespan. It's about our health span. Right. And the quality and of life. Raised, yeah. Yes. I was raised a really sick kid. You've probably heard me tell my story. I was raised by two smoking parents and my mom doubled her smoking while she carried me on the advice of her physician. Another story. I was literally saved by a physician at the age of 12 who got me from 52 allergies and chronic lung issues back to health through diet and exercise. I know what we're capable of. And to me, if we can start at infants, like I see a lot of one day old babies and two and five day old babies because I fixed tether tissues so they can suck from a breast so their tongue gets more robust and takes a neutral place and literally expands the upper arch and creates that transverse width that the tongue will find a nice resting posture and all of that avoid crowding and avoid airway issues and broaden the nasal base. That's amazing upstream work. But all of us, regardless of who we are in dentistry, unless you're in just an adult practice, should be seeing kids under the age of one. And because we as a profession haven't adapted to the new recommendations, we lose those kids to pediatric dentists for 16 years. Not only a practice killer financially in every other way, but we lose the ability to impact these children from a young age and have an amazing ability to help them learn how to eat whole foods, how to get good sleep, how to breathe well, how to exercise well, how to develop character, how to build relationships with our team. We do hands-on learning for every child at every visit. So we don't polish teeth and throw a toothbrush in a bag. We stain the plaque on their teeth. They choose whatever they like to clean their teeth. And in a mentored approach to hands-on mentored approach to self-care in literally a lighted magnified mirror, we help them de-plaque and we take a good look at their behavior. What are they able to accomplish? What goals are they working on? What developments have they made since last time? What influence did they choose to work with? And with what time is left, we do hands-on science with them, 80 different science experiments. So now we have, I'm writing recommendations right now for my 47th and 48th student to become a dentist. It's crazy. So oh, cool. I love that. Because by the time they graduate high school, They've literally screwed in an implant, looked under a microscope. They've done acid-based chemistry equations. They've taken an algae in their own mouth. They studied the bone narrative extracted teeth. They know how to use a diagonal dent. They've placed a sealant on an extracted tooth. They've done a lot of dentistry. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, Anyways, that's, thanks that's for asking about people. kids. They are, yeah. they are my passion and I love working with them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're sure get great, brave parents, you and me. We team up with parents who are health driven. That's to right. Create healthy skills, behaviors, and habits for a lifetime. 
Absolutely. And that is true prevention. So I, I am so grateful to you for leading the charge and being brave to, to look around and see what's needed and then develop systems to make it happen. And so I, I want to promote your Total Health Academy because I know listeners are listening and going, yeah, this all sounds really great, but how do I actually do this? And you have created a system for that. So tell us a little more about how to access that and, and what that looks like. Well, I feel like, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? Just the way I have. We didn't develop all this overnight. Right. I just happened to be creative and find new solutions for things that weren't working. Um, Total Health Academy is like a menu where you would sit down to a fine dining experience and decide what you want to eat first and second and third and what you have room for, and then come back another day and eat a few more bites. And when I say that, it's probably three to five years of learning. It's an online learning academy for you and your whole team where you would have anywhere from 35 to 55 minute video modules. You go home and look at them at night uh, and come back as a team meeting and tackle one thing at a time, depending on what you want to work on first. Is it reflux? Is it chronic systemic inflammation from food sensitivities? Is it diabetes? Is it a new perio paradigm? Is it a pediatric airway? Is it caries control? Is it you know treating caries disease instead of just popping holes in teeth and shoving some something in it, right? It's what what all of these aspects and then facilitating health change behavior, how to market it, how to show up in the community and support a community, how to build co-referral relationships with medical professionals across the aisle that make a big difference. I know, I don't know if you know this, but I think 48% of my patients are referred by the medical community. Those are great referrals. Yes. Yes. You know, because you had yes. one referred to you today. Yes. And doesn't it feel great because they're so ready to yes. take what you offer, right? Yes. Because they come with confidence, just like when we refer to an orthodontist or a root canal specialist. They're not going in there going, well, I don't know. We'll see. They know it's going to be expensive and they know what they're going for. And so when I say that, I hope that dentistry isn't perceived to be expensive for them, but everybody has their own. I don't practice in a fancy area. So everything can be surprisingly expensive, a single crown, right? Right. right. So, you know, we haven't talked about this, but another time we can talk about how to have financial conversations to help people afford the dentistry that they want. Because listen, I can get them to buy in 100% and then they might see it and go like, I can't do that. Right. And we can say like, how do we make it affordable for you? And how do we prioritize? And how do we move forward without making you feel ashamed? or embarrassed or uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. Well, I we will put the link um, for the Total Health Academy here on this podcast so our listeners can look, look at that. Um, and then, you know, obviously you guys can tell she is just amazing to listen to. So tell me, where are you speaking this year? Where, where, where what's oh your gosh. Next, uh, oh gosh. presentation? Let me think. I'm speaking this week in Anaheim at the California, or next week at the California Dental Association. I am at Under One Roof. Nice. All right. Yes, I love for it. all of you hygienists, I'm super excited. I want to be a hygienist when I grow up. So it was a real <laughs> honor for me to be invited to Under One Roof, which is the largest dental hygiene meeting in the country right now. Um, what else am I doing this summer? The Pediatric ADA Children's Airway um, Symposium, which is almost exclusively uh, pediatric dentist and orthodontist, although it doesn't need to be, I would love for every hygienist in the world to come and be part of that. Um, that's in Chicago in July. I think I'm just trying to go through my next couple months. <laughs> um, I'm speaking um, for a couple of uh, state association meetings. And let me think the, oh, greater New York airway meeting. I'll be there on Monday after Thanksgiving. So if you're going to the greater New York meeting, I'll be there with a really incredible lineup and I'll speak at Airway Palooza. So I'm speaking at some of those um, and a whole bunch more, but you can find me on drsusanmaplespeaker.com. So. Awesome. Well, clearly I'm, I'm sure that you guys are wow like I am. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you are doing for our profession and for our patients. It's a beautiful thing. Um, your parents would be very sure. proud. Oh, you're sweet. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I am hopefully, uh, we, we will have another podcast with you down the road because you just, you just have I so much, that. so much good to share. We got to get it out there. 
but right. thank you. You're a good team. You're such a great interviewer, Chris. Oh, thank you. Thank we you. Didn't, we weren't prepared. We, ne- we didn't do anything to prepare for tonight. And I love it when we can just have a dialogue. So well, thanks. we're equally passionate about the same thing. So I think it just makes it easy. For sure. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time and your passion. And everyone have a great week. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I'm going to also put the links for um, Dr. Maple's books. So please, please, please look into those. Those are really educational for you too that open the door to have conversations. So check those out as well. But Dr. Maples, thank you so, so much. We appreciate your time and everyone have a great week. Thanks, Carissa Wood. Have a great week yourself. All right. (laughs) Bye-bye, everybody.